Alvin Behanovich is a metal picker who suffered a pulmonary embolism caused by poison. Poisons abandoned at Huck Chemical Plant in Tuzla in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Talking about how he came to be exposed to the poisons, he says, we removed the gunmetal valves that lay under the manhole covers so we could strip out the metal pipes below. That was work. But after some time, we came across the barrels. Their contents were sinking. They sank so strongly that it hurt my eyes. I couldn't take it. I stopped for a while, but later me, my father and the neighbor went back to cutting out pipes. And we found it there. We didn't know that it was poison. The place wasn't even marked. And he describes being poisoned like this. When it grabbed me and threw me down, and when blackness fell over my eyes, I couldn't reach my car. When I found, when I, when I would bend down to pick something up, I would feel completely out of breath. And I had put up with this for around 14 days. I thought it was caused by cigarettes. However, Alvin's uncle wasn't so lucky. He died from burnt lungs after he had inhaled poisonous gas from the pipes that he had cut. Behanovich's story is just one of the experiences that belong to many impoverished and unemployed former industrial workers who have been left with no other option except to become part of the scavenger economy, picking through the abandoned factories for scrap metal to sell. During their involvement in this work, they're regularly exposed to abundant hazardous waste, which leads to statistically high level of deaths, untimely deaths, both as a result of accidents and by the more prominent, slow deaths from the chronic conditions they develop. And all the while in this hack, chlorine alkaline complex in Tuzla, this abandoned factory still houses unguarded 120 corroding barrels of mercury, 47 tons of highly flammable propylene dioxide and unknown quantities of chlorine. Poisons leak into the communities and cause slow deaths. I begin my talk today with these slow deaths, whose etiologies are included in the poisoned peace that is endured in Bosnia and Herzegovina today. And I examine these untimely deaths as a symptom of the toxic and wasting socio-environmental relations that were violently imposed through the 1992 to 1995 war in Bosnia and are violently maintained as peace today. So today, Bosnia and Herzegovina can be said to be poisoned politically, economically, and environmentally. The wartime logic that made possible concentration camps and hidden mass graves to hide the crimes of genocide has continued in the so-called post-war period. The American broker Dayton Peace Agreement, which ended the war in late 95, cemented the wartime logic into the daily functioning of the state of Bosnia and Herzegovina. It did so by administratively dividing the country mainly along the former front lines by mandating in the new constitution identification with only three ethnic groups as the only possible means of exercising political power, which in its turn led to the installation into power of the same ethno-capitalist elites who had led and profited from the war. This peace agreement marks the so-called transition of Bosnia and Herzegovina as the never-ending choking and suffocating of the citizens of this country, further depriving them of basic rights as well as their means of livelihood. So Bosnia and Herzegovina lives a terror of peace. People, social relations, and natural resources continue to be produced as waste in the rampant chase for profits by the ethno-capitalists who soaked the transition of Bosnia and Herzegovina into liberal capitalist democracy in the blood of its people. And to make things worse, those who survived are confronted 
daily by a false choice. You either accept the date and peace agreement, the story goes, or risk another war. So the ballistic politics of wartime has nearly re been replaced by the suffocation politics of the post-war, a politics in which an oversaturation with governance through poverty, insecurity, and trauma makes daily life in Bosnia completely insufferable. So Bosnia and Herzegovina is in a chokehold caused and maintained by the peace that it suffers. This concrete materiality of, of this suffocation is perhaps best seen in some of the following data. The UN Environment Programme it ranks Bosnia and Herzegovina as the second deadliest country in the world when it comes to the number of deaths per head of population caused by air pollution. So in terms of life loss, due to pollution and toxins, the European Environment Agency has collected even bleaker figures. It is estimated that annually Bosnia loses 60,500 years of life on account of pollution, or 21.6% of its GDP. <laughs> the children are born ill, and when people start living here, they know what it is that they will die from. These are the words of Goran Stojak, who has a small local community in Bukinje, in the area of the city of Tuzla. The Bukinje is located directly across the road from the co-operated Tuzla thermal power plant, and it's attendant by coal slurry sites. So Goran Stojak speaks of the decimation of his local community on account of both the various cancers and the horrifying silence surrounding the premature deaths by the public health institutions or by the authorities. But no matter where, in Bukinje, in Zenica, Banja Luka, Mosta, Tuzla, Lukavac, toxic politics shows how populations are produced as mere bodies who are now sacrificed for marginal gain. Is this not the ultimate end point of what Wendy Brown calls sacrificial citizenship. As the citizen in its oblatory function in relation to the imperative growth in the increasingly authoritarian practices of finance capital. Every day, I know this because I live and I metabolize this political, economic, and environmental toxicity in Bosnia. I'm aware of the centrality of a disposable body that labors around the clock to break down and filter both the material and symbolic toxicities. Because we work around the clock. Our working day is extended to a lifetime. As time that our bodies spend filtering and metabolizing the toxins from industrial waste. From when we are born, we know what will be the cause of our deaths. And this testimony by Goran Stark indicates a sacrificial abstract form of domination in which value is extracted from communities. For instance, in Bukinje, where a hugely disproportionate number of children have cancers, from metal pickers like Aldin Behanovic, who inhale leftover chlorine and burn their lungs in the ruined chemical plants near Tuzla. From impoverished agricultural communities, who use contaminated water, from people who venture into unmarked territories throughout Bosnia and who are killed by landmines. We are produced as waste, and from us as waste, value is extracted. This form of social domination, such as it, 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 it exists today in Bosnia, should most productively be examined I thought as a symptom of the epoch of the waste scene. So this waste scene is a conceptual framework through which Mario Palmiero and Angelis reframe waste as the process of wasting by focusing on socio-environmental relations that instigate and maintain wasted people and wasted environments. So the waste scene is part of these scenes, Anthropocene, capital scene, etc., etc. But unlike these 
labels, it neither bemoans the predicament of waste being everywhere, nor does it reflect melancholically somehow on some fantasized loss on environmental pristine condition. Rather, waste is seen as an analytical tool um, that enables us to examine how capitalist ecologies impose sacrificial abstract form of domination, such as I've talked about. So the basic scene focuses on the effects of capitalism on life, and therefore focuses on how the violence of the capital metabolized by humans, non-humans, and various ecosystems is erased and is kept invisible. So in foregrounding socio-environmental relations and arguing for the centrality of the body, on or in which metabolic workings of capitalism are played out, the waste of the scene aims to repoliticize our socio-ecological crises. So wasting is primarily a relationship rather than some sort of mistake to be solved. So if we examine Bosnia and Herzegovina today through this framework of, of, of the waste of the scene, so the peacetime loses the aura of homogeneity which obscures the workings and the effects of a continued wartime logic and everyday violence of the wartime logic in peacetime. So in making visible that which is maintained as invisible, the waste the scene emphasizes that which Rob Nixon has called slow violence. So slow violence is a form of violence that is difficult to perceive and is slow to draw attention to itself. Because as Rob Nixon says, it takes place gradually. It is out of sight. It is violence of delayed destruction that is dispersed across time and space. It is an attritional violence. It accumulates that is typically not viewed as violence at all. So such violence accumulates gradually and is felt on a different temporal scale. So the temporal scale is a type of testimony to the ongoing but invisible deaths of Bosnia citizens. Deaths that are a mere prolongation of wartime injury, despite them not being present in our daily memory. And why? Because there exists no social form that would hold, acknowledge, register, and record these deaths as social deaths. So against this silent depoliticization, the framework, the framework of the waste scene brings back the politics to the disposable bodies as political bodies who now struggle to survive an insurrection or more mimetically, a sabotage of the social relationships which enforce the bodily boundaries of the waste scene. So this is the repoliticization that redraws the boundaries of the possible impossible. And this kind of contradiction exists by focusing on the production of political possibility itself. itself. Now, in the post-war ethno-capitalist settlement in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the political struggle is the struggle for political time. So how is this the case? So in Bosnia, toxic politics of the waste scene colonizes political time, thereby slowing down and suppressing the thinking and the enactment of alternatives to the emotion of the impossible that is presented and kept operative as the status quo. Indeed, time itself has been modulated in what may be perceived as a paradox. So Bosnia and Herzegovina is deemed to be suspended between the war that hasn't quite ended and the future that had not yet commenced. So this suspended time has been beautifully termed by uh, Stef Janssen, an anthropologist, uh, the Dayton mean time, which is produced through an endless loop of depoliticization. So what is saturated with this mean time, with the experience of there being simultaneously too much time or no time at all? with the experience of, which actually captures the ways in which time for concrete political action is colonized. In this meantime of the terror of peace, bodies are not merely suspended, 
they're not put on hold only, but they become a material suspension themselves. This suspension now absorbs, metabolizes, and stores in them solid poisonous particles. So oversaturated with toxic particles <laughs> and toxic depoliticization, either by being literally saturated with heavy metals or by being deprived of political participation or by being forced to speak only as a victim of violence, <clears throat> bodies become deprived, their capacities to think, to organize and enact are depleted and exhausted. So, stranded between the losses of the war and the losses of the post-war privatization, the question is, how can our communities break through the destructive conspiracy between toxicity and poverty, which is exerted into existence by the ruthless self-interest of global finance capital? How can we maintain and keep alive the little rage that is left in our poison, exhausted, and asphyxiated communities to hold accountable those who have profited from this conspiracy. <laughs> and these, from my everyday practice in Bosnia, seem to be key questions. So when imagining and, and articulating this democratic struggle, these sites of toxicity in Bosnia and Herzegovina should be connected with, say, toxic sites in the USA, such as Cancer Alley in Louisiana, or Naples in Italy, or in Lebanon and Beirut, or in Brazil, such as Rio Dotsa, right? So such connections reveal the shared predicament and enable a much needed metaphoricity amongst the wretched of the waste scene. So in the case of Bosnia, the concept of the waste scene enables us to go beyond this particularist perspective that may readily end up in the complacency and political paralysis of a victimized position. And this victimized position is something into which citizens of Bosnia and Herzegovina have been drilled, both through the governance by ethno capitalist elites and through the so called transitional justice mechanisms. And then indeed, to focus on a properly colonial dimension of wasting. So this waste colonialism in Bosnia and Herzegovina manifests itself through the industrializing practices of finance capital that greedily exploit factories. They come, strip them of assets, remove capital from communities where these factories are located, and then they leave, leaving toxic substances, unemployment, and toxic narratives to circulate in these communities. So waste colonialism as a feature of the waste scene enables us to analyze and make visible the inseparability of environmental instability, international finance, violence, and power. In the context of Bosnia, such conceptualization makes possible a proper historicization of the logic of wasting. To conceive of the destruction of Yugoslavia as a production and maintenance of wasted people and wasted social relationships by finance capitalists. In other words, my contention is that the abandoned or hidden industrial toxic waste in privatized factories that are stripped of assets in Bosnia and Herzegovina is a synecdoche of the wasting of Yugoslavia. So this perspective suspends the depoliticized grip that this kind of date and lean time has on the destruction of Yugoslavia. So I would claim that we must rewrite the history of the destruction of Yugoslavia from the ruined and toxic sites of former factories. Intervening in this fashion, the now reconstructed history will tell us how Yugoslavia as a country was expropriated, was literally put out of the the legal bounds being placed outside of the law, and then it was destroyed. How the working people as the political subject of Yugoslavia, constitutionally enshrined as Radni Naru, was expropriated and destroyed. And how Yugoslav socially owned property, or Drushtvena Svojina, that tied the political subject 
Radni narod was the working people to the polity of Yugoslavia was expropriated and destroyed. So wasting is fundamental to this destruction. So wasting becomes established by the ethno-capitalist elites in the early 90s as the form of social wealth that confronts and paralyzes living labor, radminar, as it's called, and converts it into mere workers, metal pickers, people on board, workers who are just uh, uh, wage laborers now. And through a suspension of Dushtan Asvena, destroys social relations that were produced in the interaction between the living labor and socially owned property. In other words, the destruction of Yugoslavia must be conceived through the concept of wasting, lest we should get interpolated into the ideology of the date and meantime. So the waste scene brings back contingency into this seeming necessity and speaks of the formation of a revolutionary project that encompasses the making of collective identities out of struggles, building on the embodied experience of capitalist violence, and the constitution of a revolutionary subject in the making and experience of the waste scene in an antagonistic relationship with all the forces that created. So the struggle for political time is first and foremost the struggle for air time for time to breathe and for time to articulate. And all the while in struggling to do so, we have to listen to those who are out of breath, to the rasps of testimonies, to those vocal attempts when taking a breath. Because as an index of a struggle to live, they are still in excess of the inca incapacitating violence that has caused them. Now I want to move to some of the artistic and activist practices that I've been working with and I've been engaged with. Um, I'm going to show you so this is the platform Zenia what is that? The platform um which I established as part, part of the anti-fascist organization on Slobode. Um, and this is a platform for environmental humanities. Um, those who are interested could, could visit it at zemnevodazak.com. So Zemnevodazak brings together arts, activism, and academia to instigate these innovative, imaginative, and courageous combinations of activist organization and endeavor, scientific, scientifically based research, and artistic practice for the defense preservation and enhancement of the environment. Um, so the idea was to actually have um, the reshaping of how environmental violence is conceived and we see the continuation of the wartime project in the acts of environmental violence. So we are not treating um, environmental violence, first and foremost, it is important for us to talk about it as a type of violence rather than when an explosion happens in a factory that it is a dehistoricized or depoliticized event. No, it's just something that has its proper history and its proper politics. Uh, I usually talk about Bosnia being poisoned by peace today, and this is actually very much interweaving into, into how uh, people are sacrificed for the gain of very particular elite that led them to the and uh, profiting from them. So we also talk about ecological justice, um, which is how communities are brought together to reconstruct the narrative of the destruction and then to actually think about some sort of a claim. This is, of course, inspired. Um, from the lessons of 2000, big 2014 protests that are, it's a huge misnomer. I mean, they're usually called Bosnian Spring, right? Akin to the Arab Spring. There's nothing springy about it. Um, just like the Arab Spring wasn't anything springy. Um, but the workers with whom we worked, the fire factories, decided to, to rise up against the, um, the larceny of their factories. 
and to protect one detergent data factory from being stripped of assets and closed down, the workers occupy the factory. So exhausted after being undermined by the private owner for three years, and for three years not being paid, um, they decided to defend their livelihoods and the factory by the occupation. So their message was very clear. They said, we were not on strike. We are protesting to maintain production. And all the while they produce. So, so for me, this is the this is the political axiom that was born. Um, that's only relevant political axiom in the past 30 odd years. Uh, we are in protest to maintain production. So this new axiom brought together disparate groups protesting in the streets, in open citizen assemblies or plenums, in which citizens deliberated ways of dealing with 20 years of socioeconomic ruination and putting an end to the political status quo. So on a large scale, these protests and plenum became a protest for the production of a new social configuration, one that cuts ties with all that makes impossibility convincing. So working in communities that have been, that have been and become contaminated sacrificial zones of finance capital, our guiding questions are, how do we piece together with the community the story of its own destruction and losses that it has suffered without falling into the ideological traps of the proclaimed inevitability of the collapse of socialism? How do we move away from regarding the practice of wanton contamination by the private owners or factories as a necessary evil of privatization, as well as a fait accompli, and instead insist on political and legal accountability for such actions? And all the while, being aware that the injuries and affliction suffered by the communities and factory workers are always in excess of existing legal and ethical dispensations. So our artistic and activist interventions are deeply engaged in community reconstruction. So if wasting is the principle which we live every day, we try to value all that which the increasingly authoritarian ethno-capitalist elites leave out, which they destroy, discard, weaken, and exhaust. So, so what, what is this that we try to value? So this includes our communal capacities to think through and materialize collectively the demands for more inclusive justice and societal transformation. All the excluded forms of life and new forms of life or new subjectivities that testify to the violence of the waste scene and all who seek how to end it. So valuing, defending, and nurturing this through our artistic and activist interventions, we also aim to strengthen our communal capacity to release ourselves from this emotion of the impossible. Now we'll move to the graphic novels. I was trying to figure out whether to show the film, whether to show something else, but I've opted to show you today to talk about graphic novels that we've, um, we've been making for the past three years now. Um, so this is the first graphic novel, Zemle von Zrak. And it was the first graphic novel on environmental violence that we published. So I collaborated with the Bosnian feminist author, uh, Sheva Shaharovic and Marko Gacinik, an illustrator. So in this graphic novel, we deal with the stories that cover the ongoing destruction of social structures through environmental violence, from factories destroyed and stripped of assets in enforced and corrupt privatization, to the huge internationally organized illegal and clandestine abandonment and dumping of hazardous waste in communities leading to the illness and deaths in these communities. So there are five stories, and by the way, they are, uh, all these graphic novels are on zemdevolensrak.com. Uh, so there are five stories narrated and illustrated in very realistic style. So, but the emphasis here is on, on, on living people, right? Um, 
on whose bodies this kind of environmental violence continues to take its toll. So these are these depleted, porous bodies, such as those belonging to Aldin Behamovich, whose story I shared at the beginning. So living people, their narratives of survival and protest are contrasted against the ethno-capitalist deadening, deadening of people, deadening of factories, deadening of nature. Uh, oh, this is a second. Oh, yeah. So, so we, we kind of range in these aesthetic considerations, uh, whether to use graphic. Um, now, let me, let me actually first step back and say, why, why graphic model at all, right? So we wanted to draw on the long tradition of comics and graphic novels that cross class and generation divides in Yugoslav popular culture. So in the 70s, and in the 80s in Yugoslavia, graphic novels, comics, uh, were widely, widely available in cheap print and were one of the drivers of countercultural practices. So partisan characters such as Mirko and Slavko, or Conan the Warrior, and then later Alan Ford, Dylan Dog, to name but a few, they offer different, often marginalized narratives that are imaginative, serious and fun, actually. So these cheap graphic novels are circulated, exchanged and traded across generational class and gender divides in Yugoslavia. So it is estimated that between 71 and 81, a staggering 11,611 different gra graphic novels and comics uh, were published in Yugoslavia. It's a huge collection. So we, we kind of, aim to build on this countercultural tradition of social reimagining and exchange and sharing that has allowed for and produced different kinds of solidarities and intimacies in this kind of circulation. So our choice kind of ranges from, from documentary and realistic to this manga type. So this, this is the, the story about the Huck factory. And these two, these are two factories as the iron beast, the rise and fall something from from these from the graphic novel um this big letter talks about how factory is destroyed how it becomes a threat as something they used to nurture the workers and communities is now perceived to be as a threat and how which is a, which is a separate thing but we can discuss it perhaps later how the, during socialism there existed very strong working class environmental consciousness, how workers um, protected the environment, not just through a particular set of arrangements and laws and regulations, but how there was this awareness and that continued throughout um, the so-called post-war period. Uh, this particular episode is taken from an interview I did with a worker who threw himself into a 20 meter high flame to rescue the community, because otherwise, if it had exploded, 47 tons of gas would have destroyed something in the radius of 50 kilometers. Um, this is another novel on how Mittal family bought a coke coal plant near Turbo or Kamas. Completely disregarded. But this is another, this I like to think of as very Leibach type. Um, to make or doing this and, um, but it, it is a way of of, of talking about um, uh, the past talking about how intergenerational solidarity can be achieved which is another important thing because trauma in Bosnia operates by completely disregarding any sort of generational connections so um, Writing on, on how graphic novels have the capacities to revive political imagination, anthropologist Larissa Kurtovich and Andrew Gilbert uh, themselves are now through our collaboration involved in graphic ethnography on Data Factory. They've actually talked about very important affordances that the genre of the graphic novel offers. Ge the graphic novel is sequential art, it is a participatory art. So the they say that the graphic novel 
And the graphic form can also help redefine what counts as political labor, as well as to identify and describe overlooked and underappreciated sources of political commitment and political will that were nevertheless critical to achieving important victories. In finding new locations for the political, we make space for political thinking and action beyond abstract terms such as nationalism or neoliberalism. And we, once we link these representations to generative nature of sequential art, and this gener generative capacity of sequential art actually comes um, and is based on an open reliance of comics and on the imagination and participation of the reader, we can see how graphic ethnography can pull readers into having a stake in the story and in the fate of its protagonist. So, how to conclude this is always a question for me. I'll have start by going back to this notion of how Bosnia is poisoned by peace. So the Dayton Peace Agreement may have ended the spectacular side of wartime violence in Bosnia and Herzegovina. But in its place, it ushered in a deeply anti-social peace, whose main logic is never-ending extractivism and the perpetual wasting of socio-environmental relations. So the toll of such peace are slow deaths, whose causes remain obfuscated and unrecorded. And the seizures and pollution of ever greater swathes of land, water, and air are not accounted for at all. So, not only is the wartime logic of the ethno capitalist elites enshrined in the peace agreement, but now, under the imperative of growth and development, the increasing the authoritarian method of governance by these elites is sanctioned and forcefully imposed by global capital networks and foreign governments, and the EU for that matter. So the destitution implied in this kind of mantra of growth and development has long been known. Right? Bo I mean, Bosnia is, there's nothing specific and particular and exceptional about Bosnia. Right? Bosnia and Herzegovina is not isolated from the global extractivist network. But what is specific about Bosnia is that such violent extraction is framed as peace, to which is appended a threat that if an injustice of peace is challenged, a new war can always erupt. So under such threat, how do you stand up to and how do you challenge an antisocial peace? I mean, how do you set about antagonizing a ways to see peace? Perhaps one may begin this challenge with the proletarian lung of Aldin Behanovic, whose lung is burnt, who can barely speak. Or you start with these newborn babies in Divkovic and Bukinje, whose toxic deaths are already scripted. You start perhaps with the workers of former chemical factories near Tuzla, who collect mercury from the destroyed and stripped factories with their bare hands in order to prevent their communities from dying from horrible poisoning. They themselves sacrificing themselves to prevent that. So these are partial organs and body parts, or even lives that are already sacrificed, but they comprise the social body of Bosnia and Herzegovina, on whose sacrificial metabolic labor, the filtering of toxins, the cleaning of hazardous waste, all our lives rest. 
So they unacknowledged the slow dying of the social body of Bosnia and Herzegovina, demands that these deaths also be acknowledged and mourned as social deaths. It is precisely this art activist production that I talked about that aims to recuperate these deaths as social deaths, the anonymous deaths caused by the toxic antisocial peace. For me, this means reconstructing and returning to these anonymous deaths, their socio-political causes, which demarcates the perpetrator from the executed. But what about those who are still alive, but seem to be relegated to the ineluctable anteroom of a toxic death? Do we mourn them before their death occurs? Or do we attempt to value their lives, not as a painful index of an impending personal and social death, but as an effort to live? As a protest to maintain the production of the possibility of life itself. In Bosnian society, disfigured and wasted by so many bosses, we also have to, be, to base our politics, which aims to restore and recuperate socio environmental relations, on affirming life for the sake of all life, both human and more than human. So, this is the properly political act of antagonizing the base scene. One that erupts the anti social peace in protest to maintain the production of nothing less than a world in which societal life itself can thrive. Thank you.